in Dubai. So why do they dislocate again? Why? We started to doing some arthroscopic repair in the early 90s and we went back and looked at the first 100 cases or 190 cases and you see the recurrence rate was not so bad, 9%. And uh, we did certain analysis of age, fixation method, and what else. But it wasn't, it's just the bone loss. It's, it, it isn't the age, gender, and activity level injury mechanism. It's really the bone loss. That's the main risk factors. And you know that 30% of this recurrent instability they have also shown that the risk factor is the hill Sachs lesion, it's the glenoid bone loss. These are the main risk factors age a little bit if the patient is uh, less than 21 years old, age at the first dislocation, this is also a risk factor. When we looked at our results after revision surgery, revision means atoscopic revision after open procedure again, the results were not so bad, 80% could go back to sports after a mean of nine months, 76% returned to previous level with little and no um, limitation, but again, it's the bone loss that the biggest problem. And we learned that we have bone loss on the glenoid side and the hill Sachs lesion. And we know that the combined problem, combined glenoid and humal head defect, is an additive and negative effect on glenohumeral instability. Stability. So bipolar lesions are not uncommon. Number of bipolar defects increase with recurrence up to 80%, and I will show you live. So we grade the apprehension test nowadays. We look for additional instability, um, sulcosine, like hyperlaxity, gadget test, hyperabduction in introduction. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. Can you advance, please? Advance. Yeah, that's why we should think about the imaging and we already heard some nice talks about. So it's not enough to have just plain x-ray. You can miss the posterior lock dislocation. We almost need today a CT scan and a 3D imaging device like here. Then you can understand and we get better comparing. Oh, this doesn't work again. I think it's the point. Yeah. I think it's a pointer. Yeah. Oh, yes. I can do it here. Yes. Yes, I do it here. That's maybe better. So you see that um, 3D CT scan is very helpful, but MRI can help you. It gives you soft. Uh, first impression of the bone loss, but we really recommend to do a CT scan, 3D CT scan. And this is the command. This is not really a gold standard. Gold standard means that a 3D CT scan with humerus subtraction will help you. It's most important to see an en face view of the glenoid because we will speak a little bit more about the glenoid. It's not a significant difference between 2D and 3D CT scan. MRI is more observer dependent and usually it's no possibility to adjust an our fast view and you cannot measure the defect size. That's why, what shall we measure now? Um, there are some pioneering work like Steve Burkett and Joe Devere, they noted that 61% failure with inverted pear shape, Etoy 
said 21% of the glenoid defect cannot be restored with a bunker repair. So Guy again checked 100 CT scan and showed that 50% showed a non-measurable anthroglenoid bone loss. So that's why Joe de now went a little bit more in detail and you see now that the failure rate is so big when you do a bunker repair because you lose the bone defect. Um, Ito did this is again a little more precisely, but how do you can, can you measure in your daily work? That's the easiest way, um, what we call quick and easy way. You just measure the diameter of the glenoid and you measure the defect and then you can calculate. But remember, you do not get the whole bone loss because the, we would overestimate the defect because um, some area you cannot really calculate. You see the red par, uh, part of this. Uh, so the percentage error is quite big and that's why we have so many um, people who will like to add and some, uh, the, they had several methods now like Sugaya, Steve Burkhardt, Bodhi, Sugaya again, Christian Gerber, um, a lot of methods now on the way. So what we really need to know that the bone loss starts of 7.5% in a significant degrees in force prior to dislocation. It's a wonderful biomechanical work of Shin. So if we have more than 15%, the bunker repair cannot restore the glenohumeral translation and will restrict the range of motion. Why do we care on the glenoid? Because the contact area and the pressure following labral is different. And you see here on the right side, 30% of the glenoid bone loss, the contact area decreased a mean of 41%, and this is significant. So that's why we have to take care of the glenoid. And on the other side, we have to look closely to the hill sacs. And Giovanni Di Giacomo measured this and brought this on in the, our discussion on and off track. You will see it much more hill sacs lesion. In the first time dislocator is 57%, 94% a recurrent dislocator. But what is really the size? What is the critical size? We do not know really because it's not a clear evidence. But that's the easiest way for you to measure. You measure A and B, and if A is more bigger than B, then you have to fix also the humeral side, not only the glenoid side, both, because then you will have a, a problem. Um, it is a risk factor off track. We measured in our 100 cases here, and we have seen that 33% patients, percent patients with off track lesions had a revision cases. So it's a clear evidence that we have to look on both sides, glenoid and humoral. Glenoid options, bankert, open or atroscopic, latage, allograft, on the humoral side, rapissage, plication, oats, illicrest, or prosthesis. What we do now on the glenoid bone loss, we do a latage procedure, as we just heard several times now. If the defect on the glenoid side is more than 15%, then we do a latage procedure. And here just a history of one patient, proof of concept now, you see, he had an atroscopic stabilization four years ago, traumatic dislocation when he was jumping in water. You see now his holes in the glenoid and we see the missing bone on the glenoid side and that's how we fixed it. We, knew, we just heard several publications now, presentation, so I can skip this. Um, but remember, the risk of osteoarthritis is not really the same. Both have a risk of osteoarthritis and two big publications. The first publication, we looked at 100 shoulders, 13-year follow-up, and we have seen that even these patients, 28% 20, developed some kind of osteoarthritis after 13 years. But even in the group of Shil Walsh, also he had osteoarthritis in 24%, osteoarthritis after 20 years. So in both techniques, you can have some osteoarthritis. Is the sports a risk factor? No, bunker repair provide better return to sports than Latage. A nice study, match pair, multicenter study. So remember, bunker repair is better if you want to go back to sports. So we have to address both Latoche, Ilia Crest on both sides. Sometimes you will get away with one shot, but not in all cases. You remember, look at the right side, the coracoid itself can be 
quite small and maybe it doesn't help you. So it, uh, you have to measure, you have to calculate with the, with the CT scan. What about Rampi search technique? We did a biomechanical study looking for knots, knots between two anchors and two knotless anchors with a tape bridge. And you see on the lower side right with a tape and two anchors in both, then you have enough stability as a remplissage. But in nowadays now, we do try to avoid remplissage because you will restrict internal and external rotation because you have to fix the infraspinatus. That's why the medial posterior application, capsular application reduces the anterior shoulder instability in this wonderful study. And with the new anchors, the knotless anchors from Artrex, it will help you and you don't have knots inside of the joint and they really can stabilize in addition um, for the glenoid. So, how I address hill sax lesions, sometimes rampissage, sometimes olds, but in cases with epileptic history, I rather use some small metal implants, hemicap, uh, or outer surface, something like that. So that's my worst case scenario. That was a football player in January 2017, and you see there is some kind of hill sax lesion. The glenoid doesn't look so bad. I did an MRI three days later. Now you see how big the hill sax lesion is. The anterior bone loss on the glenoid side is 21%, but a huge off-track hill lesion. What shall we do now? We did a CT scan, and now you can realize how big the defect on the, on the hill sax really is, on the humeral head is, and how big the bone loss is on the glenoid. So it's about much, still more than 21%. What are the treatment options? So iliac crest bone block for the hill sacs and a lateral shade transfer, as you can see it here. So that didn't look so bad. That was just one month later. You see now filling the defect on the humor side and um, the um, lateral shade procedure on the glenoid. So importance, the lessons I've learned, there are two problems, sorry, two problems now. Um, Great, get proper, proper images, measure carefully, add your surgical procedure, address both pathologies properly entirely, and pick the right procedure for you that you can solve the problem. Thank you very much.